All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, hopefully we can leave some time for some good questions because I'm sure after recent events there might be a few. Um, so first off, uh, my name is Chris Teitzel. I'm the CEO of Locker. And I'm uh, Luke Probasco. I work uh, the Drupal side of business over at Townsend Security. And I'm uh, David Strauss. I'm a CTO and co-founder at Pantheon. And so uh, we're just going to jump right in here and talk about common security myths. And uh, surprise, there's uh, not just five. Um, that is the first myth. Uh, you know, other, other myths, uh, you can read them up there. But, um, you know, we always like to say there really is no silver bullet to security. And we'll talk about that a little bit more um, in the next slide. But one of the things that I like to also talk about is that, um, you know, we often hear that like a website hosting platform handles all the security for you, which they do a really good job at handling the security for like the infrastructure, but what you do and what you build, that's still sort of up to you. Um, and another myth that I, we often hear too is like uh, all the security that I need to be concerned about is taken care of in uh, Drupal core. I actually heard that at this conference, so I, I was like, wow, this is pretty important. There's still uh, some misinformation about that. Um, another one that, that we hear is that, oh, I'm just too small. Uh, I maybe just have a bro brochure site, which uh, you'd be surprised at what kind of information may be collected uh, for by marketers in a small brochure site. Um, and actually, smaller uh, Sites are actually a bigger target because hackers know that smaller sites maybe not might, might not have the strong security measures in place. And actually, recently Symantec uh, did a study that three out of five cyber attacks target small and mid-sized companies. Um, and further, uh, small sites can be especially vulnerable to um, automated attacks. Um, and you know they think that maybe the smaller sites don't think they have anything to offer a hacker, which really isn't true. Um, you have a comp uh, computer uh, and power and visitors, uh, and that is of value to hackers. And a place where people can publish phishing pages, a place where people can send out spam, um, just Bitcoin the computer mining, resources. Bitcoin mining, JavaScript, all sorts of good stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So when we look at uh, security, we need to look at it in layers, all the way from the device up to the people and the policies and the procedures that are being run in the environment. Um, to think that you can solve your security problem with any one of these layers being super, super solid uh, is just a fallacy, and it's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, most hacks actually occur at uh, the very top of this, the policies, the procedures, the awareness, the people the human aspect is the, the greatest vulnerability to security that we have. Um, this has been uh, recently updated, which is awesome. This is the 2017 edition, um, which came out at the end of 2017. Um, but this is the OWASP top 10. Uh, if you want to look at where do I start, what are, the, what are the table stakes that I need to be looking out for, um, these are them. Uh, we won't go through them in, in great detail because we have a lot of content to get to. Um, but if you go to uh, the OWASP, they actually have a GitHub page where they have uh, the PDF and full explanation of every single one of these attacks, how they occur, uh, how to protect yourself against them, and to learn more about them. So I, I highly recommend that you go there. <clears throat> uh, one of the ways that we like to consider security is in this CIA triad. And despite the CIA name, it doesn't have anything to do with the government agency. It simply stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, the first two people readily associate with security, um, confidentiality being things like inf uh, avoiding information disclosures, keeping private information private, protecting PII. Uh, integrity is around the idea that if you download updates for your laptop, you want to make sure that no one has nefariously injected an app update on the network and modified what software you're going to be installing. That's integrity, because um, integrity is often an important concept when uh, the information itself is not private, but it needs to be authentic. Um, but the, the third one is what a lot of people miss, which is availability. Um, if your site doesn't, isn't functional, uh, or people can't get their job done, uh, or um, 
otherwise uh, something is standing in the way of achieving business value of a process, then all the security you could possibly be assigning to it may not be that valuable because an e-commerce store that you know knocks itself on offline because of some security measure that they've put in place, um, it might be great at protecting credit cards, but it's not great at getting any. Um, the <clears throat> so uh, it's important to balance all these concerns. N none of these three is particularly more important than the other. So um, one of the, the uh, things that I've been talking about for a few years now is um, how much HTTPS matters uh, for sites. Um, how many people in here are running their sites on HTTPS today? It's getting better and better. This is, we're starting to get like 90% plus. Um, for any remaining sites uh, that are still using HTTP, or maybe you have a mixed environment of some HTTP, uh, it's undermining um, the security, ranking, and uh, functionality of your site. Yeah, uh, just to sort of add, uh, for the marketers, maybe you just mentioned this, but like uh, HTTPS, you rank higher in Google. So it is you know, not just important for security, but your marketing teams will thank you. You also get access to HTTP2, which is locked behind HTTPS in most browsers, even though it's not an intrinsic part of the spec. Uh, most browsers like to treat HTTPS as a carrot, where you get additional features you can use on websites by using HTTPS. Um, and the advantage of using something like HTTP2 is that you can sometimes get better performance depending on how you set up the site. So it's not even just necessarily a performance burden to get higher ranking, it also unlocks some capabilities that might allow you to get better performance than you otherwise would. <clears throat> um, however, uh, it's important to deploy it properly. Um, the um, Google cares quite a bit about um, how long it takes to actually get the time to first bite on a piece of content. Um, and uh, also it's how things kick off the race of loading a site. And this gets more into that sort of availability um, heuristic uh, in the sense that um, you have to have the information be available, it has to be uh, accessible in a way that's compelling to your audiences. And security that you layer that undermines the actual functionality of the website or performance of the website, which directly bears on its functionality, uh, isn't always a good move. So it's important to do HTTPS, but it's also important to do it right. Uh, I don't want to go into um, too many details, but we'll, we'll touch on a few of the deployment concerns around it. Um, one of the things that um, you need to think about is, is uh, around, um, uh, and we should probably skip through a few of these, not, uh, like quickly, um, but, because uh, <clears throat> I don't want to dwell on this too much because I, I, uh, I've covered it in, in uh, some other talks too. But basically, um, browsers are talking to servers, they're negotiating this connection. Um, by putting servers close to um, the users, it allows you to, um, to negotiate that connection faster. That it's like going to a neighborhood store versus going all the way downtown or going across the state. Um, but the, one of the big benefits for um, this in your deployments of sites is not just in terms of conversion rates and load times, but also um, there's, there are competing factors with um, HTTPS in terms of how you deploy it versus uh, mitigating your exposure to things like denial of service attacks. So um, all of these considerations of, of, let's see. There's a lot more than I remember in here. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, um, the um, <clears throat> uh, so I'm happy to go through them, but I, I'm just worried about burning too much time. Sure. Um, the, uh, yeah, let's, um, Let's skip that and let's do this. Okay, this is what I really wanted to talk about because um, so um, when you're deploying HTTPS, one of the things that people often do is it's easiest in many cases to just deploy a certificate to a single server. You get your HTTPS, you get your like Google ranking boost for it, for it but uh, there's a competing concern around availability and um, integrity and confidentiality when you're deploying a system like this because if you deploy it as a single point of failure and you concentrate your security on one endpoint that happens to host your HTTPS, you also make yourself vulnerable to denial of service attacks, which have grown massively in the last couple years. There we go. Uh, in fact, the largest one to ever have occurred occurred in the last two months. Um, and it occurred at a rate of, uh, what was it, 1.4 te uh, terabits? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 1.4 terabits per second. And there's no real single server that can just handle that kind of traffic. So it's important to balance these concerns. Uh, and what I usually recommend is deploying HTTPS to a CDN. 
Um, you can get it free from Cloudflare. A lot of, almost every other credible CDN has an option uh, for you to deploy uh, certificates, uh, even if it costs a little bit. And that ensures that you're actually balancing these concerns, that you're not undermining the performance of the site, you're not undermining your resilience to denial of service attacks, and you're delivering good confidentiality and uh, integrity uh, of the pages to the uh, people who are visiting the site. So <clears throat> when things go sideways, um, this is something I like to talk about uh, with folks, and, and you really need to be able to prepare for this. Um, because what you want to have is monitoring and alerts. Uh, you want to have team code reviews. You want to have processes in place that will catch an issue before it goes out. Um, because we're all human. We're all going to make bugs in our code. If anyone thinks um, that they don't write buggy code, uh, I'd love to talk to you and, have, uh, and hire you. Because uh, I do. Everyone on my team does. So it's more monitoring, alerts. How can we find that and fix it before it becomes an issue or before it becomes exploited? But when it does, um, and, I've, and I've had to deal with this with clients, I've had to deal with this um, in, in a number of ways, is uh, I, always, I always go back to the three, the three Bs. First thing is backup. Um, and this is because you want to do a post-mortem afterwards. You want to be able to go back and say, what happened, why, um, and, and fix that, whatever that was, in order to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So back up. Even the, the infected code, back it up, isolate it, push it away. Second thing is breathe. Um, this is the thing that most people forget to do. They start panicking and freaking out like the whole, the whole room's on fire. Um, you'll make more mistakes in split second and, and crunch time decisions than you would if you were to just let it sit out there for maybe five, 10 minutes and gather yourself, figure out what's going on, and then deploy your procedures. Um, you may actually amplify the attack or amplify the exploit um, by just yourself trying to react to it. And then the third one is build. Um, and build again and again and again and again with your team. Uh, have that post-mortem. One of the most powerful post-mortems I've ever seen is, um, how many people remember, it was about two years ago when S3 went down and pretty much the entire web just started freaking out. Um, <laughs> that was all because a single developer fat-fingered a, a command which was supposed to clear out a couple of uh, buckets in S3. He ended up clearing out all the buckets in the East Coast. Um, and Amazon came out and said, that issue wasn't his fault, it was ours for letting him to be able to do that. And I thought that was a really, really powerful post-mortem of not blaming, not pointing the finger and saying, how dare you run that command, you shouldn't have done that. They looked at it internally and said, why did we even give him that power to delete all of S3, right? Um, and then, oh, why did we put so many of our systems on there without redundancies, right? So it's that type of post-mortem that you need to look at when something like this happens, it exposes the, the flaws, but it allows you to fix them and make it better. And that's, what, that's what's important to go, go on and go on. Um, which, um, to highlight, is um, <laughs> the most recent issue which we had uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, first off, this is Jasper. Um, buy this guy the drink of his choice if you see him. Uh, Jasper, are you in here by chance? I don't know if he's here. Um, one of the awesome things is that uh, Jasper is part of the community, and this was found as part of sponsored um, Security reviews. His, his employer actually sponsored his time to, to review this, uh, review core and find bugs. And I think that's an amazing uh, testament to what our community does and the, the community of, of uh, companies that we have around. So um, uh, if, in case anyone's not familiar with the vulnerability, uh, what happened is, is that Drupal's um, render array has a code uh, execution vulnerability as you might be able to tell from the patch related to some of the pound sign stuff. Um, and so Drupal Core has uh, implemented filtering around uh, some of the, da uh, the poten potentially dangerous parameters that could be injected. <laughs> and so Core, um, as, you, as, as David mentioned, um, it now has a general sanitizing function. Um, one of the interesting things about this is that rather than um, specifically fixing the one exploit, which almost highlights that exploit and allows people to build on it faster. Um, this patch was actually a more gener general one. Um, and the, the release and the notes around the release were more general. Um, and I, and I, I attribute the lack of uh, immediate exploits and, and further exploits to um, kind of the vagueness that's around this and that, um, you know, once everyone's patched and once we're, we're you know, confident in that as a community, then it's okay to go talk about what went wrong and why. But in the meantime, vagueness of we weren't sanitizing things, now we're gonna sanitize things better, um, I, I think that's good and that, that helped uh, prevent the, the 
uh, automated exploits that we saw back in 2014 uh, with the SQL injection. Also, patch your sites. Uh, our statistics show that only about 40% of Drupal 8 sites have been patched so far. Wow. So one of the one of the awesome things was to watch uh, how many people were in Twitter, Slack, uh, wherever on <laughs> patch day. Um, it was actually really fun. Like there was pizza, there was beer, there were donuts, depending <laughs> on what time zone you were in. Um, everyone was like posting memes and, and videos. Um, and we all had a lot of fun with it. And then once the patch released and we were all DDoSing the server trying to get that patch, um, <laughs> once that was mitigated, um, everyone patched um, that was online. And they were, it was awesome to watch the whole world kind of roll that out. Uh, and then David can talk too, but um, a lot of the, the platforms were able to mitigate instantly against um, uh, exploits. So if you're on a, a uh, hosting provider that is um, focused on Drupal and has uh, a background in Drupal or, or folks that are on the Drupal security team, um, they were able to get in and, and patch at a, at a platform-wide level to give you that time to go and patch so you were, you were protected. And, and these measures by time, they're not designed to um, supplant patching. Um, but it does allow us to collect interesting s statistics. Uh, I was basically constantly looking at the, s the stats around uh, what um, traffic was coming in matching the filters that we had put in place. And uh, we actually saw some old exploits match the filters. Um, not a whole lot of legitimate traffic, but we hadn't, at least as of days into the release, seen anything that looked like a credible attempt to exploit SEO2. And I think that goes back to the vagueness and the um, communication from the security team in releasing the PSA, making sure everyone is aware and that everyone was patching right away. Um, a lot of the times hackers and, and script kiddies and, and whoever, they're looking for the easiest door to knock on. Um, well, I also, I wanted to compare against uh, what happened with SAO5. Right. And what was that 2014, I think? Yeah. Um, that was ex uh, exploited actively within seven hours of the release of the security patch. Right. And so um, when, a, when a hacker is looking at um, going out and, and automating an attack, many times they're, they're knocking on doors, knocking on doors, and if one opens, then they'll keep on going through it. Um, and I think the fact that a lot of the major platforms were, were doing platform-wide mitigation prevented um, some of that uh, automated scripting from being able to occur so quickly. Um, but one thing you have to think about if you're not on a platform um, that's just hosting your Drupal site is where are you putting your site? Um, and a lot of the times the marketing team will just say, hey, we're just gonna throw this in there. Um, and the IT team knows where um, their servers are, so they're just like, okay, we're gonna dump it in here. Um, and if your marketing and brochureware site is sitting next to the rest of your entire business, a small exploit in your marketing or brochureware site will now exploit everything else that's inside that, that environment. Yeah, and, and if you visit a site like WikiLeaks, for example, you can see all these dumps of emails on there and almost all of them were captured as a result not of hacking the email system directly, but by getting a foothold through a more public presence like a website. That's how the Panama Papers happened. That's how some, I believe uh, some of the hacks on the Democrats happened. Um, the, um, and it's definitely how um, some of the other attacks uh, happened for some of the email dumps. Um, probably at least four or five of the ones on there I've, I've verified as like coming through a path like that. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, one good thing to look at is having um, authentication before application. If you are doing uh, an internet or something that's going to have private information on it, rather than exposing the, the public website or the website to the public and then having people log in, put your authentication in a layer one above the application. Um, and that a lot of the times is uh, a SAML or if you have some sort of, um, uh, you know, open directory or, or some sort of uh, uh, list in, inside your EDU or, or, or enterprise. Um, I, I, have, I always joke I have a, a forehead sized dent in my desk from SAML. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not easy to work with, uh, but it is uh, very powerful at being able to put that, that authentication layer one in front. Um, and it also adds single sign-on capability, um, and there's some great modules for Drupal for that. Yeah, and there are some alternatives that are starting to be available as SaaS products now. Um, like Google has the their identity aware proxy that they call it, uh, and that allows you to authentic uh, to proxy stuff to the application only if someone has passed the authentication gateway. And I think Cloudflare has a product now along those lines as well that allows you to basically wrap the app and not send it a byte of traffic until it's verified as at least a an authorized user of the system, even if their privileges may vary. And this speaks to the power of using social or enterprise logins. 
Um, <coughs> Drupal's login and, and password security is good. Um, however, uh, I always say these companies and products have more time and budget to spend on just solving the password and two-factor authentication than you probably have for your entire year on the website. Um, so why are you trying to do something that they're already doing better? Um, and, and you may as well uh, allow them uh, the, the, or allow your users the flexibility and the ease of use. Um, so Facebook, Google, uh, Twitter, those all have um, uh, you know, social logins. One thing to highlight is 1Password did just release 1Password uh, for Business, which allows your entire business to, have, uh, to give out license on a per user basis. And then it gives each user 1Password uh, for their family as well. Uh, and, and I think that's really uh, interesting because not only is it promoting good password practices in the business, it's promoting good practices, excuse me, good password practices at home, which um, help re, um, reassure that, uh, that, that folks are getting in that habit. They're not just doing it at work and going home and using the same password 20 different times. Um, and so definitely look at these. Um, and, and if you're not using a password manager, do it. The best password you, is the one you don't know. The, um, so I, I just want to add one more thing on that. Oh. Um, the, so one other thing that is interesting about working with some of these social login vendors is um, as a result of kind of Facebook and Google's like all-knowing eye of Sauron um, in terms of like where our devices are and all of our uh, data, um, is that they actually have really good heuristics on when a device is not ours. Uh, uh, when it doesn't look like it's in the right place at the right time, or that you did some interactive thing in, uh, in Nashville and then another interactive thing in, um, in Germany within 10 minutes uh, isn't plausible. Uh, so they know information like that and they actually use it as part of their security and your website will never have enough information to be able to uh, provide some of the heuristic security measures that they have in place. Yeah, excellent point. And um, like I said earlier, it, it's the people, the policies, the procedures, the awareness um, that most often leads to the exploit. Um, and so you want to be able to secure your team. Uh, you know, get good policy um, around uh, sign-on and, and passwords. Um, the one thing that I, I push for, for a lot of teams is Keybase, keybase.io. Um, it is like Slack, but encrypted. Um, and it also mixes in a little bit of Dropbox where you can have an encrypted file share as well that's either private or uh, via team. And so um, this prevents the, hey, what's that password? Can you just Slack it to me? Um, or God forbid your client sending you the root password to their server via an email, um, which I've had happen. Um, and so I just now tell all my clients, um, before you send me anything, sign up for this, and then that's how we're gonna communicate. Um, and then last but not least, it's just that, con uh, that security consciousness. You wanna have um, constant reassuring uh, that you are secure, that you wanna stay secure, and that you're going to do um, these steps to be secure, and, and keep that as a, as a top of mind, not just oh crap, we're hacked, now let's go be secure and, and put on our security hats. And then uh, just started a follow on uh, the comments on authentication. Um, uh, we haven't really gotten too deep on uh, keys yet, which we will, but uh, I thought that this was a pretty interesting quote. Um, Our review has shown that a threat actor obtained access to a set of AWS keys and used them to access the AWS API from an intermediate host with another smaller service <laughs> provided in the US through the AWS API. The actor created several instances of our infrastructure to do reconnaissance. So basically what's that, what that is saying is uh, API keys, you have them all over your site if you integrate with third-party services, those should also be treated as uh, sensitive information and protected. Um, and let's see. Uh, and one of the, the things about this is that this breach is, again, getting your foot in the door and then expanding elsewhere. If you have, uh, this was an over-provisioned AWS API key, and if you have an over-provisioned role inside of AWS and you use that API key to do just you know, your S3 storage on your website, uh, and somebody gets that key, they can spin up, they can get all your encryption keys, they can get into your databases, and in this instance, they're actually able to spin up um, EC2 instances inside their VPC that then allowed them to do reconnaissance on data inside. And so when they came out, they basically had to say, we don't know what was gone, but they had enough information, enough access that we can assume that everything was gone. Mm -hmm. And just even to follow up a little bit more on that, um, you know, we, we mentioned protecting APIs, <coughs> keys can prevent unauthorized uh, access to web services, but, uh, you know, developers need better control over private keys and API passwords. So, like, 
for example, what if a disgruntled offshore developer decided to send a mass email from you? You know, you have to have a segmentation there. Um, also, Bank Info Security uh, recently did an interesting article saying um, that McDonald's, you know, the, the fine gourmet restaurant, uh, has acknowledged that a leaky API exposed personal information for users of its uh, McDiv McDelivery mobile app over in India, and the flaw exposed names, email addresses, phone numbers, home addresses, and sometimes coordinates of these homes, as well as links to uh, social media profiles. And this was also what um, we recently experienced with Panera. <clears throat> Panera's uh, delivery app um, had an open API uh, that wasn't authenticated, it wasn't behind any side of w in, inside of any wall or anything, uh, and you could uh, basically go to it and put in a, a user ID and get back a, a piece of information that you could just iterate through that because all the user IDs were sequential. Um, and it, it allowed you to scrape all of their customer data, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, all that. Um, the one thing to point out there is that they were notified of it eight months prior to it being public, and they did nothing until about two days before it was prior, or um, before it was made public, and even after it was made public, they still didn't do things fully right. So um, if you do get a report from somebody or an anonymous email saying, hey, you have an exploit in your site, take it very, very seriously. And, and one other thing, we've been talking a bit about API keys, but um, also encryption keys are really important. You can be encrypting data all day long, and if you aren't properly managing those keys, it's sort of like leaving the keys to your house uh, underneath your welcome mat. Um, there's a suite of modules, we can talk about them later, but uh, you know, places that the modules want you to put them are things like your config file, and you know, it's just really not secure. Uh, and further, uh, and I thought this was pretty interesting, uh, PCI, for people that are familiar with that, the payment card industry, um, they uh, just released some cloud computing guidelines, um, and it was published this month. And, and I thought it was particularly interesting because they were describing services such as, like, well, I don't have to list those, but, uh, but what, one of the things they said is uh, strong data level encryption should be enforced on all sensitive or potentially sensitive data stored in the public cloud. Uh, and because a compromise of a provider could result in unauthorized access to multiple data stores, it is recommended that cryptographic keys used to encrypt and decrypt sensitive data be stored and managed independently from the cloud service uh, where the data is located. So, you know, if you think about like cloud service providers offering, some, you know, their key management as a service, you know, you really want to put all your eggs in that one basket. The, uh, and, um, <clears throat> And one thing that uh, I also like to say about the keys is that if your key is accessible under exactly the same terms as the data that it encrypts and decrypts, that is security through obscurity. Uh, because you are just creating one extra step uh, toward actually getting access to that data, and that extra step doesn't involve compromising any additional systems. Right, so um, I've seen often uh, modules, especially in Drupal 7, I've seen it in WordPress and elsewhere, um, where they will store uh, an encryption key in the variable table or the option table underscore like it's encryption underscore key equals value and that's in the exact same database that the 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 encrypted data is in um, that does nothing absolutely nothing and it's super easy to find um, and then you have to think about um, what are you going to be encrypting and how are you going to be encrypting it uh, luckily uh, over the last couple of years we've had uh, a really good team working together to update a whole swath of um, encryption modules. So now there, are, it should not be an option of, or a question of, you know, should we do encryption or should we not? I don't know, it's too difficult. Um, there really are a, a lock set um, number of modules around encryption now that should make it that um, if you are having to store sensitive information, which you, if you don't have to, don't, uh, but if you do, you should have the tools at your disposal now. Mm -hmm. And further, I uh, just wanted to kind of dive a little bit deeper into this because a lot of times people uh, say, well, I don't take credit cards or social security numbers, so I really don't have anything that needs to be encrypted. And that's really not the case. Um, you need to be asking your clients the right questions and, and provide them with security that they're expecting. And, and some of the things that they might not think <laughs> it is considered uh, personally identifiable information is uh, things like your uh, full name or um, you know your digital identity, your date of birth. 
uh, a lot of times these are IP addresses. These are things that like your marketing software, or you know, if you say, uh, you know, give us your email address and we'll give you a white paper. Your marketing teams do this all the time. That information actually uh, is considered PII. And one extra thing about this is, um, you know, we're a community. Projects get passed from shop to shop. Um, you'll end up inheriting uh, websites from other shops. Uh, don't just trust the other developers that they're knowing what this personal information is and that it's being protected. Um, I can speak from experience about a week ago. Um, we found a uh, directory inside the files directory um, that contained a whole bunch of passport numbers uh, that was publicly accessible uh, because the previous developer migrated it from a WordPress site and forgot to take that back out of the files directory. Um, so you, you will get left those little Easter eggs and make sure that you're looking for uh, fields that have these names or others that kind of set off um, some spider sense and say, May, maybe we should be doing more. Uh, um, sorry, one more thing on that. Um, uh, also, if you, have, uh, if you allow image uploads by public users of a site, uh, there are now ways to automatically redact pub, uh, PII on things like images using services like Go uh, some of Google's machine learning tools. Uh, they actually have a pre-built <laughs> machine learning system that basically you plug in images and it will just blur out PII, like credit card numbers, check account, uh, bank account numbers, um, probably like passport numbers, things like that. And I know that sites that allow users to upload images, especially if they get published publicly, uh, are often at risk of distributing PII inadvertently. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're not really gonna spend a whole lot of time on compliance, but uh, I did really wanna talk about GDPR just for a second since a lot of People are buzzing about it. Uh, Shrop actually did a really great session, I think, yesterday or two days ago on it, so you should look for that on uh, the recordings uh, if, if it's interesting to you. But uh, a couple things worth noting. Um, under GDPR, which is the EU GD, or, uh, General Data Protection Regulation, uh, it says that um, security requirements uh, apply to both data controllers, so those of us who accept information uh, with permission, as well as data processors, such as like a cloud service provider or other infrastructure as a service offering. And additionally, if data flows through your systems, uh, you are considered a data processor, even if you don't use it. And uh, one of the other things that I thought was pretty interesting uh, is Article 17, the right of erasure, uh, also known as the right to be forgotten. So that's basically saying that someone can say, I don't want you to have my information. Um, and that could, that can pre present a lot of challenges if you think about it. Uh, but one cool way, going back to the keys, uh, what if you were able to assign each person their own encryption key? And then when they say that, oh, I don't want my information anymore, just delete the key. And uh, in the cryptographic world, that's uh, referred to as cryptographic zeroization. Uh, and it's an effective way to do that, and it's also covered by uh, standards. Uh, and currently, Chris, I think there's a module being worked on to do that. Yeah, well. so the GDPR module, um, my team's actually working to extend that to have uh, a method that will allow you to do uh, a key per user, and then one key per site that wraps it and, and then does a rolling every time that somebody requests to be uh, forgotten. Mm -hmm. One interesting part about this is that um, the right to be forgotten um, becomes very, very difficult in our massively backed up world, right? So we have all these backups that are sitting on locals, that are sitting on um, you know, cold storage, and, and some of them are hot backups. How do you effectively erase somebody from everywhere in existence? Um, and the answer to that is you cryptographically zero them out. Um, it's the exact same method that Apple uses to remote wipe your phone. They're not actually wiping the data, they're just wiping the key that's used to decrypt the data that's on your phone. Yep, uh, well, one additional note on GDPR. Uh, when someone requests that their data gets deleted, uh, there's a 60 day window to actually Correct. delete the data. So you can also make systems intrinsically compliant uh, if you ensure that things like logging systems never retain data for more than 60 days. Uh, there are also some exceptions in the standard for if another standard regulation uh, requires that you retain something for longer, you can make sometimes make exceptions to GDPR. It is designed to mesh with other standards, not to just uh, have to stand on its own. Correct. And also, actually, before we move on, one thing that I don't think we said yet and if you're not super familiar with GDPR uh, and you hear us talking about the EU, it actually covers, if, if you're doing, you know, collecting information of anyone in the EU, you don't have to actually reside in the EU. You don't have to have a business presence inside the EU or the, the UK uh, in order for it to apply to you. If you are touching the data of any uh, citizen that is covered by the GDPR, um, then you're needing to um, 
keep yourself to the the regulations. Yeah, but again, uh, Shrop did a great session, yep. uh, and and I highly recommend checking that out if you want to learn more. Uh, and we've been talking a bit about encryption, uh, so we'll just kind of cover this quickly. But uh, you know, there is no native way to do, to encrypt data in Drupal. Um, however, there is a great suite of modules: uh, encrypt, key, uh, field encryption, file encryption. There's there's a lot of them. Uh, Feel free to come talk to us after after that. We've you guys have worked a bunch on it. We've mm -hmm. sponsored a bunch on it. So, um, but a couple things worth noting uh, when you think about encryption: um, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, validated AES encryption means that you're provably encrypting data correctly, which is very important for com compliance. I saw a stat somewhere that like half of the uh, encryption implementations that go to NIST get turned around because they're not done correctly. So uh, it is important to consider that. Um, uh, also, you know, we, we talked about this briefly, but it's worth mentioning again. Uh, hackers don't break encryption. They find the keys. That's why it's really important to separate the encryption keys from the data that they protect. Uh, and let's see, and finally, you know, you know, with keys, uh, make sure you're storing them and managing them separately. Uh, you know, they, they, hackers find the keys. And uh, for those who need to meet compliance, uh, encryption and key management are very important. I'd also like to give a shout out to Libsodium being now in PHP core. Yep. Um, that is an excellent suite of cryptographic uh, functions and utilities that mostly keep you on the rails uh, to do things correctly uh, and don't let you make too many dangerous decisions. Um, these are a couple of, uh, they, sh they should be no-brainers, um, but I just wanted to mention them as well here towards the end. We'll, we'll kind of cruise through these and get to questions. Um, make sure you keep up to date, um, like we had uh, recently. If you're not patched yet, go patch now. Uh, literally stop, walk out, and go patch, um, because it is something that you need to do right now. Um, but if you... <clears throat> The nice thing about some of these uh, continuous uh, delivery systems that are, are being integrated into some of the hosting platforms or you're able to bake on your own is that when a, a patch comes out like it did a few weeks ago, uh, you can just press the patch into the continuous pipeline and it rolls itself out and all the tests are done. You know that everything's uh, been properly rolled out and, and so invest in that because uh, sometimes, not on this one, but sometimes exploits come out very quickly. Um, the other thing is um, within the CMSs, the, the core of the CMS, um, this, the, the core security team is, is top notch and they keep core pretty safe. Um, and they have an absolutely insane job of trying to keep contrib safe as well. Um, and you know, Drupal, we have uh, a good number of, of uh, modules, WordPress, there's a ton of plugins out there. Um, and most of the vulnerabilities that are, are seen are actually seen in the module uh, layer or in the contrib layer, not in core. Um, in in uh, when we talk about the severe ones, um, you know, uh, um, high criticality comes across every you know once every four years or so, um, where uh, a high criticality in contrib happens you know every few weeks almost it seems. Uh, and so be sure to choose your modules wisely, look through them, uh, make sure that you're you're familiar with the people or the code. If you don't, um, review it yourself before you release it to live. This one should just be a given. If you're not using Git already, do it. Um, don't cowboy code um, where you just, you know, I call it push and pray and you just <laughs> SFTP into the server and say, oh, you know, we'll do it live and just push it out. Um, it, it's just a, a horrible way to do things. And, and the nice thing about Git is that it, when you're talking about um, some sort of, um, you know, remote code execution or if they have access to your file system and they start uploading their own files, uh, you can use Git to see what they've uploaded. You can easily revert and you're off and, and running. And so with that, uh, we'll open the floor to questions. They have requested that we use the uh, microphone in the center of the room here if you have any questions. Uh, if you don't want to use a microphone, um, we'll echo back what we hear. Oh yeah, uh, and one last thing. Um, part of uh, why I skipped through some of the CDN slides is uh, I provided a talk yesterday that's also available online that covers in depth all of the issues around integrating CDNs and HTTPS for your deployments. So um, I just wanted to uh, let you know that if those did interest you, uh, they are covered extensively and available online. So I just have a general question about CDNs. Um, my employer right now, we don't really leverage them, but in a critical reason why we have not really liked it in the past is that we have a lot of information that, that at least needs to be protected at rest, not not necessarily encrypted, but at least protected at rest. And it's never been clear to us if there is a way to do that. Do you know if there is a way to? 
to protect it at rest. Right. Uh, so um, uh, I know Fastly as a CDN has options built in on every plan level that you can enable that allow you to achieve HIPAA and PCI compliance on their infrastructure by ensuring that the data never gets written in a persistent way at rest on their infrastructure. So it allows them to be in the middle uh, without uh, <coughs> ever persisting it to disk. They will keep it in memory if you tell them to cache the content. Of course, they won't cache it if you tell them to not. Um, but um, it, there are pretty extensive options there, and there are other CDNs as well that can that will fit in with your compliance goals. And if anything, they should improve your opportunities for compliance because uh, things like PCI, for example, have ever ratcheting requirements around HTTPS, like TLS 1.2 became a requirement recently. Um, they have cryptogra uh, like cryptographic algorithm requirements. They have certificate signing requirements, um, and. Uh, working with a CDN that is ratcheting its infrastructure up to keep up with that compliance burden uh, will help you keep that at arm's length. Okay, one, other, one other note on that is um, some CDNs, um, I know Cloudflare uh, did this at one point, they allow you to choose whether or not you want the uh, connection back to your server to be authenticated uh, or secured. Um, always choose that um, because it, it, it defeats the purpose. Um, it was It was... You know, it's easy to say, oh, the CDN's giving me an SSL cert and I get the shiny little green lock in the, in the bar, uh, but then the data's trafficking back to your server uh, unencrypted. So make sure that the SSL uh, follows all the way back to the server. Mm -hmm. Of course, thank you. Yep. That's actually a good segue. Um, hello, my name is Stephen Hughes. I'm from Texas. Um, I worked in cybersecurity prior to joining the state of Texas. So I wanted to touch on a few points and kind of further the dialogue a little bit. One thing I've seen in the enterprise space, um, I work, you know, government agency, is that setting expectations isn't always done well. And with regards to encryption, um, I wanted to uh, encourage others to, to maybe set these expectations for clients of, of you know, mid-market and larger websites. End-to-end <laughs> -end encryption is what we are seeking. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with load balancers and firewalls, because the word encryption is a little vague. And right. you know, some people feel if they got the HTTPS in place, they're good, game over. But you can also do packet sniffing, and packet sniffing is, is something that the, you know is dangerous on the enterprise scale, especially with Amazon uh, AW2. Um, so I was curious, touching on that a little bit. Do y'all have any any advice or any sort of um, you know topical you know deba debate with regards to end encryption and how that how those expectations can be set and, and under, understood by stakeholders? Because every time I've mentioned it to a client at an enterprise scale, they're just like shocked. Like, what do you right. mean we have to isolate servers? What do you mean? We have to do these things, and, and I have to you know, instruct them, like, yeah, it's, it's expensive, but it's also more expensive not to do these things. Right. I, I think it's important also to define what is meant by end-to-end -end encryption in the sense that uh, there's encryption that is end-to-end -end in the sense that it encrypts on the first device, and no matter how many other devices it passes through, it only gets decrypted on the final device. Mm -hmm. um, that is one way uh, that people conceive of that, but I think that's one of the less balanced approaches when it comes to web security, because... You actually really want to have something like a CDN as a middle uh, CDN or a firewall or a, um, a load balancer as something that is decrypting and then re-encrypting the traffic uh, because you want it to be able to inspect things so that you can put in place things like WAF rules so that you can block denial of service attacks based on their patterns. Um, if you do true end-to-end -end encryption in terms of all the way from the origin to the web server, you minimize your security tool set in other areas. Uh, so. Uh, what I usually advocate is um, is encryption every step of the way, um, and then uh, occasionally that last step, especially if it's on a trusted network, may not be encrypted, and I think that's often okay, especially if that area is firewalled. Uh, I, I'd also like to add, you know, it, it, encryption at rest can, is, you know, obviously important as well, but uh, one thing that I think is often overlooked uh, is, you know, don't trust your users. You never really know what they're going to upload either. So, um, you know, we've worked with people that say, like, you know, we have a comment section on, you know, that contact us. Crazy stuff gets uploaded there that you don't want to be responsible for. Yeah. And um, there's two aspects to end-to-end -end encryption or just encryption in general. A lot of folks think, oh, I'm trafficking PII. I have HTTPS. I'm okay. Um, wrong. Because... That just protects it in transit. You also have to protect it at rest or wherever it goes. Right. Um, and so there, there are two very important aspects there. The green bar in the top just means that you're talking to the user. It doesn't mean that that data is actually being traffic safe. And there's that, 
as a user, be aware of that as well. If somebody's asking you for private information, um, just because there's a green bar there doesn't mean that it's actually being stored at the other end properly. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's important to look at not only each step along the way for end-to-end -end, end -end encryption, uh, but then also to think about what's happening with that data that should be encrypted at the other end. And, exactly. and one thing that you can do that's even better than just encrypting it at rest is to not keep it at all. Exactly. If exactly. you have that option. Yeah. 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 Thank you, guys. Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? I'm Michael Goodick. I'm also from Texas. Yeah, my question is, so am I. it's kind of a <laughs> uh, general question about uh, Drupal admin and production, mm -hmm. right? And so there's this holy grail I've always been going towards of like, you want a production instance where we can disable all the admin users, disable everything that has to do with um, changing the site in production, right? Mm -hmm. Turning off modules, turning off rules UI, views UI, admin menu, all this stuff, right? So that when you have, you can have all these contribs, yep. but then if a security advisory comes out, you're looking at it, you can see it's critical, but it, it, effect, it only effect, it's only relevant if you have, if that's enabled in production, right? So it gives right. you a buffer for mitigating the <coughs> issue. And I thought we were really moving towards that, but um, increasingly, like I'm getting pushback um, where people are talking about like we're going to be editing in production again. We're going to be doing editorial work in production. And I know on a smaller scale, probably almost everybody does right. some degree of editing in production. Um, but I wanted to get your like sense of the state of like how, how many people are actually not are have no editing or configuration change in production. How common is that at this point? So there, there's a really good module for that um, that's config read only. Um, with Drupal 8's config management system, it will track, obviously, all the changes and it allows you to move uh, those changes up in the environments. Yeah. Um, it allows you to also lock um, certain environments and say, this environment is read only, um, which means that modules can't be enabled or disabled. It means that certain um, anything that's stored in config cannot be changed. So somebody can't go in and change the email password. They can't do all that. It doesn't lock down the content. Content side of the house is where, um, yeah. But I would, I would push back on that and say mm -hmm. that the, the content could and should be updated in the live environment because trying to synchronize databases between um, staging and all the way up becomes a very difficult um, uh, thing to do, especially if you have users um, that are being created by the site. And it's, it's all independent on, on a site-by-site -site basis. But if you lock down the config portion of it, and you have some workflow moderation around um, the content so that content can't just be created and pushed up, um, that there are you know parties notified in the in the meantime. Um, I think you can you can have that blend of uh, securing the config and still allowing for editorial freedom. I, content on, but it does require that all those con those content editing admin modules are enabled in production in order to be able correct. to correct. And, right. and I th I do th I agree that I think uh, I, I agree with Chris that, that like I think content editing in production is generally appropriate, especially for certain use cases. What I would recommend is if you really, really want to lock this stuff down, one option is to go with more of a decoupled front end, mm -hmm. and then you expose that decoupled front end. It's only able to access the APIs to actually do read-only content. You can basically set it up where it can only do get requests uh, for the, the Drupal REST APIs, and then you can make the Drupal instance itself protected by something like that identity aware proxy or a SAML thing like that so that you actually do lock down the editorial access behind a layer that is not Drupal. And then, and then that combination of those two things that this decoupled front end has read-only access to the CMS instance, and everyone who has direct access to the CMS has been authenticated through another layer, um, would allow you to establish a lot of the guarantees you want without literally locking down editorial production in live. And I've, I've worked on a few yeah. um, large-scale enterprise sites that have uh, multiple layers. It's a decoupled site and it has multiple layers of caching as well. Um, and that provides another great kind of firewall against uh, somebody push content out, not necessarily in a nefarious way, but just content they shouldn't have or something got published. It'll take an hour for that to actually reach out to the front end decoupled app. Uh, and so you can kind of catch it in the meantime as well. So, uh, Jason again, and the, uh, I just wanted to share a, a different pattern that we've been using. So, we have the um, Aquarius on demand uh, mm -hmm. environment, and I know they're sp supposed to be kind of like used for continuous delivery and stuff, but they let you keep them up for a long time. So, what we have been doing with that is we allow our, um, 
or you know, content power users, basically. They're basic, we call them site administrators. So basically, on these on-demand environments, they ha also have admin privileges. They are protected by SAML. Like you, you ca they can't even see the uh, anonymous thing unless they get through a SAML gate first. Right. And, but then they get full admin rights and then they can poke around as much as they want. And then like, hey, I have it in this state. And then they come and talk to us about it and we will get it into Git and push it out into the yeah. into an upcoming release. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of um, I think the config management in, in D8 and then what Dries was talking about in being able to have kind of this config management 2.0 that's gonna be worked on where uh, each environment can be tracked separately. I think that's gonna start allowing us to lock down the live environment more and more and more and, and keep the, that config from being changed around. Our biggest pain point is that for menus and taxonomies, configuration and content are right. not it, cleanly separated. Yeah, well, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I guess I would push back a little bit on that in the sense that I do think there's a clean separation. I think there should be, I, like, but there's no, not. No, what, what I mean is, I think Drupal imposes a clean separation in the sense that some things are very clearly defined as config and some things are very clearly defined as like content in a database. Mm -hmm. And that line may not be drawn where you want it drawn, in terms of what's considered, what's on what side of the content line versus the uh, config line. Um, and I think that there have been some debates around like how much we should accommodate that gray area in the sense of should we be able to embed some content in the config management system or, or stuff that is treated as content by Drupal's kind of own system. Um, oh, my take on it is that anything that gets exported to a YAML file? Is it, config. Yes. Yeah. I don't think it's any more sophisticated than that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we got time for one more question, and then we'll uh, we'll have to get out of here. Um, Lacey from UNC Charlotte, and actually I had two questions, okay. if I may, real quick. <laughs> um, you mentioned storing API keys, mm -hmm. but what specifically do you do to secure those? Like, is being on the web server outside <laughs> of the doc root enough, or in another mechanism that encrypts them? Uh, I don't want to turn this into a promotion, but my company actually does that. Okay. It's That's our product. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, there are options out there, not just our product, but um, but in general, yes. Um, encryption uh, or API keys, uh, tokens, anything like that. Um, the key module in Drupal 8, uh, we built purposely um, uh, general and extensible so that you can use other storage mechanisms wherever you want. Um, there's now storage mechanisms for uh, Amazon uh, KMS and some of the Amazon services, which I would only recommend if you're actually on Amazon environments and you're able to use uh, internal roles in order to authenticate to those. Otherwise, you're gonna have to use an API key to get to KMS, which then defeats the purpose of having KMS in the first place. Um, but the key module has a really cool feature that I think is under uh, publicized right now is uh, it's a, a config override generator and it will allow you to go into a, a series of drop downs and you can look up every single piece of config and say, I want that piece of config to be managed by key now. And it'll create an override, uh, an entity override, or an override entity, uh, store that in your config, uh, and then that allows key to then kind of hijack um, that, that line in the config to do whatever you want. And then from there, you can store it in um, you know, an ex a doc root or outside the doc root. Um, it's kind of the most convenient, but again, it's still in the same environment. Ideally, you want to put it one layer out. And then the second question is about the end-to-end -end encryption from the web server to an external database. Um, you mentioned that if it was in the secure network, it should be okay. We have some people in our security group on campus that still want the database credentials to be <coughs> encrypted. How, like, what is your stance like on that? Like total database encryption? Yeah, and how well, would that impact the performance of? I mean, there, there's encryption at rest for the data on the database, and then there's encrypting the credentials that are used yeah. to access the database. You're talking about the credentials. Credentials. Um, I mean, I would probably start, like, so at least for MySQL, for encrypting credentials, I would probably look at some of the X509 auth stuff that they mm -hmm. offer, because you can do things like have the X509 certificate be encrypted and require a password to unlock, and then that is used to actually authenticate to the database server. But uh, it then becomes a question of how does the CMS get the actual password to the cert to, or a key right. to the cert to decrypt it? <laughs> and if that is available under exactly the same circumstances as the certificate, then it's security through obscurity again. Um, if you can actually isolate it more, um, or do some people who want to have a really paranoid setup have a thing where like literally when you boot up the system, 
someone key, has to key it in and it gets stored in memory in an ephemeral way. Uh, that's one way to do it. Um, you could use a key management system to be able to unlock that, but you could also just store the credentials to the database in the key management system, um, and you would have a similar effect of auditing the access to it. Um, but I will might, say that that... There might be some any, performance issues around that. I was gonna, that's exactly what I was going to highlight, is that um, encryption decryption is now um, happening fairly quickly, but it still does add compute time to whatever you're doing. So if you're doing that on every database connection, you're just increasing the amount of um, compute that's actually necessary right. in order to bootstrap Drupal. Um, but then also, if you are using an external key management system, um, by nature of it being external, it's going to add latency into the process. Um, and so you want to have it in such a way where you're, you're accessing that you know, once per bootstrap, maybe twice per bootstrap at max, um, not a bunch of times. And even then, ideally not every bootstrap um, because a lot of those external systems like ours, they cost money um, and that then racks up a giant bill that you don't want to pay. But getting, uh, getting back briefly to like the security through obscurity question, the test that I like to apply to situations like that is I want at least one story of how the system could get compromised where the separation would actually allow that particular compromise to be less severe. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if there's no particular method of compromise that is mitigated in the sense of, not mitigated in the sense of like figuring out what to do to finish the exploit in terms of, oh, I need to decrypt, the, I, ha I have this key over here and I need to decrypt this thing over here um, <laughs> that I have both of them. Uh, I'm looking for situations like, okay, um, if someone, say, got root on your web server, does this, does this help with that compromise? If someone gets execution capability within Drupal, does that, or like on PHP, does that, does that mitigate that compromise? Like, um, I would be testing it against those things because it's really easy to add additional layers of security that don't effectively mm -hmm. actually contain mm -hmm. the relevant attack paths. And that, that's really what I would be asking. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. And just a quick reminder, uh, I, we don't have the link up here, but rate the session. It's, it's valuable for uh, the people that schedule DrupalCon and the sessions. And, uh, and yeah. we read it when we present again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Sorry I didn't go over those other slides. Like, I forgot that it was like redundant <laughs> with my other presentation. <laughs> no worries. And we always, ha we always like, have more than enough content to full time. Oh, well, <laughs> I and, we and did in a pretty reality, good job today, the, uh, um, the nice part about it is that they're just captured in the video capture, so okay. people can look at them if they want to, and we don't necessarily have to. Okay, yeah, and it's, I'm fine publishing them online. I just didn't want to dwell too much on the yeah. performance aspects. Right. I think we had a great pace, I thought. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. cool. Yep, yep. Well, thanks for joining us. Those are mine. Is this what you call branch? <laughs> Yeah, there is no such thing. Yep. 